And you see even how right there at where the flame is, it's slightly going red. Nice. Ultimately, with brazing, the critical thing, it's like I was talking about earlier, comes down to your temperature. How well you control your temperature and work your metal. But when you're doing aluminum in general, you do have to be very careful. Aluminum to aluminum is not so bad. When you're doing aluminum to copper, you have to be very cautious because that copper takes a lot more heat. But again, it's, it's more of a solder. All right, so the main difference between a solder and brazing is the actual temperature at which we're using. So solders, we typically don't break, you know, six, 700 degrees to do that. And, and those are just a softer joint. So that's why uh, plumbing, for example, almost everything they use is gonna be a solder type material. Uh, and, but they're not dealing with the refrigerants or the pressures that we're dealing with. So, you know, we've got to be able to handle, you know, 600 PSI most of the time. They might have a little over 100 PSI on the high end of the scale. Brazing, typically to braze, you're breaking that 1,000 degree barrier. So most of your brazing joints, you're going to be sitting somewhere between 1,000 to 1,200 degrees to get a proper braze. Aluminum doesn't show color. It, it will kind of tint, and yet, again, you have to be really cautious with it. But copper does a very good color change. So once you really tune your eye, uh, you'll begin to kind of put the pieces together on, on what that copper is doing. So we have some Silphos 15. Somewhere between 900 and 1,000 degrees, that Silphos will start to kind of soften and may try to melt a little. Uh, by the time you're hitting about 1,100 to 1,200, somewhere in that range, you will actually see that uh, silphos begin to fully liquefy and that's the state you want it in to get the capillary action. If you're not familiar with that term, capillary action is literally using the heat and we're trying to uh, attract the, um, the metal to a hot point in that pipe. So part of what you have is say you have your joint uh, and then Coming out, you've got your male ends, and you've got your, your female. You would be uh, applying your heat to here, and you're gonna kind of build up a little bit of uh, uh, rod at this point. And you're gonna transition your heat up into the, uh, the joint, and you'll see, if you do it correctly, uh, this will literally pull your, uh, your filler material or your, your, your uh, brazing rod into that joint. That's what you're looking for. Now part of that, whenever you're applying the heat in general, uh, kind of building off of this, you do want to start with that heat on your male ends, start to generate that heat, especially on a dielectric joint. So this is what we'll be using for dielectric. Uh, and then you'll, you'll move that heat into the female side. Now in the beginning, especially for metals like copper, it's, it's less impactful. So you can kind of spread the heat a little more evenly and it's more forgiving. With something like a dielectric, uh, which, which is just two dissimilar metals, you definitely want to make sure you start with the copper and get it up to temperature. It's going to be a lot harder to get it to temp over the steel. That steel doesn't reject the heat the same way the copper does. And so it's going to hold that and, and it'll turn color a whole lot faster than that copper. So that's really what you're looking for. Now, one thing I do want to point out as part of this test, this is going to be far from perfect. And this copper is going to hold heat a lot better than it would in the field. Strictly because we don't have another 10 feet of pipe that is going to be drawing that heat out of it. At the same time, this steel is not going to react exactly like it will on an actual compressor. The reason being is the compressor might have an inch worth of steel sticking out and then it's got an entire compressor body to spread that heat between. We're not going to have that here. So keep in mind, this will get you the concept of using a 56% uh, braze uh, and just how it's different from doing a copper to copper. It's not going to react the same but just, I, I wanna put that disclaimer out there. What you're really paying attention to is the color of the whole joint. One of the things we're gonna do 
on the copper is uh, we're going to simulate a, a device of some kind. So that's inch and five eighths copper many times. And what makes it hard is being able to braze that copper close to a device. Any device, whether it be a ball valve, a sight glass, a TXV, uh, anything of that nature, or even say it's a coil that has a copper stub out from an aluminum coil. Well, you can't let that heat from that copper to copper joint get to the coil. So you have to wrap the, uh, the, the copper at the coil itself. Is that making sense? So aluminum coils have an aluminum stub. The factory already did the dielectric for you, right? Uh, so those are scenarios we routinely run into. So a couple of inches from the joints, we're gonna wrap with wet rags, just like you would wrap any device, and that's gonna simulate a heat draw from that load. And that's gonna, that's gonna add a lot of challenge in your ability to control that heat to get a proper brazed joint. If you're ever doing pipe work, you can never drill or cut your taps because all those shavings and everything are gonna get in there. Worst mistake you can make. So you have to burn those taps in. And you quite literally, you'll heat the torch in just one little focused area until you burn a hole big enough to fit whatever size uh, pressure tap you have. And then you braze that in and seal it up. So if we have time, We'll do that on this long piece on the end caps, and we'll try to pressurize that pipe and see whose joints held and whose didn't. I want these to be the 56 rod only. <laughs> Almost all of your experienced field techs that have been in this for any length of time, they're gonna tell you to fill with 56 and cap with a 15 on the joint. Now, I'll pause there. A cap, and I do want all of these joints, except for maybe the aluminum, to have a cap. I want you to practice putting caps. But a cap is right at the, uh, the joint. You're gonna fill it in, and if, once you fill it, if you do it well, you might just barely have a little bit of a seam there where you can see there was some filler. An actual cap, you end up, you, you, you shift how you use your heat and the, and the fill material and you will end up uh, with a, a literal little bulge there. It's a little little lump all the way around the seam. We do that, just one, it's, it's, it kind of comes down to preference, but two, it does help, uh, at least we believe it helps. I, I don't know this on a science level, but on a field level, it's trusted that that helps make sure that we, we seal any, uh, any possibilities of leaks going forward. Okay, so I do want you to practice, fill, fill the joint, put a cap on the joint when you're done. A lot of guys will teach you that you fill with 56, you cap with 15 or five or something. Uh, I am here to tell you, that I do not want you doing that at all. I want you to use 56 and cap with 56. What that means is you have to really be critical with your heat control and your ability to control heat on this joint is going to decide uh, whether or not you're successful. And this goes for any kind of dielectric joints. A big part of what doing a 50 or a 15 cap does is it weakens that joint. It leaves you more susceptible to leaks because that 15 will blend with that 56 and you no longer have a 56 joint anymore. Because that 15 melts at a much higher temperature than the 56 so by the time you get the, uh, the 15 hot enough to melt, you've already liquefied that 56, okay? So that is going to impact the integrity of that joint and its ability to hold. You might get it to pass a pressure test and it might do great for two months. It might do fine for a year, but you've created a joint that will fail prematurely than if you'd have done it properly with straight 56. These smaller tips, I recommend running uh, usually around five PSI, but somewhere between five and 10 PSI on your acetylene and between, uh, you, uh, I'm gonna say 20 on the oxygen. On the bigger tips, on the rosebuds, you, a lot of times you have to increase that to where you might be closer to a 
uh, 10 to 15 on the acetylene, and you might have to bump that oxygen to somewhere between 30 to 40 psi. Because that that uh, that rosebud is going to move a lot higher volume, so you need a little bit more pressure to get that volume out. Now, how you calibrate that? Obviously, you have regulators, but you're going to uh, you want to crack it, bleed the pressure, stop it, see where it comes to and stops. All right. If your gauge stops at a higher or lower point than you want, make an adjustment to the regulator, bleed the pressure, try again. And you do that on both, both sides, oxygen and acetylene. There's three basic types of flame. Uh, you have what is known as a neutral, a ionizing, and a, a reducing flame. The proper flame you want to use is a reducing flame. And that's because of scale. Now, we're not going to practice it tonight, just given the scale of what we're doing, but... It is best practice in the field to braze with nitrogen. And it's just a tiny trickle of nitrogen. What you have to be careful with is when you purge nitrogen on a braze, if you allow too much flow, it builds too much pressure on the pipe. Even if you have an outlet port, it will, it'll, the, the nitrogen will fight you and push through your braze joint. So it's literally just a tiny little trickle. And really all it is is it's just enough to push the oxygen out of that piece of pipe, and that's all it's got to do. Because what happens is when atmosphere and oxygen are allowed to be in there, it oxidizes or creates scale on the inside of that pipe. And part of what will do, what will happen is, if, especially if you're using an ionizing flame, which a lot of people do, I'm guilty of it myself, you know, I've, I've did it for a long time before I really knew better. Uh, You'll, cap, you'll tune it into a ionizing flame and it significantly uh, increases how much scale you will build. So one reason why the flame is important is we want to reduce the amount of scale we're creating. Because what that scale will do is it'll break loose in the system later and that lands in your, in your metering device and it'll plug your dryers and it's not very good for your oil, compressor, or anything else in the system. All of those components, that scale will catch in and you'll, you'll be replacing it because of that. There's a couple of theories on how to light this. A lot of people will tell you, open your acetylene first, light it, you'll get all your uh, scarecrows, as they call it, or, or crows, and then you'll open your, um, your oxygen, right? So what that looks like, They look like that. I don't, personally, I don't practice that. My personal choice and how I practice doing it is I will crack the oxygen and then I will crack the acetylene, get a little bit of the mixture. If I'd open the oxygen a little bit more and I wanna I, I crank it up at, at that point, right? So when you're sitting about right there, you got a little bit of a feather so that little tip is kind of fluttering versus that. All that extra, that is your feather. So this would be considered more of a neutral flame. When you step up to this, where he's got a hard cone, this is a, uh, a, a ionizing flame. This is not really what you want. You want to step up your acetylene and run just a little bit of a feather on it, about like that. Now this is about this, the, the, the heat you would run on a, uh, this is a reducing. So you got a little bit of a feather. You've got a nice, you got you can still kind of visualize the cone and you've got a nice uh, heat feather coming out. But your main feather is that inner side, right? Uh, this is about the heat you would use on that, on that uh, aluminum, maybe even a little bit less. Now, if you're doing some larger copper, we're gonna step up the acetylene first, stretch that out, and we're gonna pull in the oxygen right somewhere in there. That's gonna be a lot hotter flame. This is gonna be what you might use to anneal with. 
Okay? And then if you were doing the really big copper, you're gonna really, not quite that far, you're gonna be cranking this little tiny guy up, but that's about maximum you're gonna get out of it right there. Okay? Now, in terms of killing the flame, my suggestion, kill your settling first. And then always blow just a little bit out with the oxygen, it's gonna be flowing anyway. That just makes sure that any kind of soot, anything that tries to build in the tip, it knocks it out. And then kill your oxygen. Uh, you can do it the alternative. You can do the oxygen, get your big yellow flame out again, and then kill the acetylene. It's not that you can't do it that way, but again, you want to, many times we're doing this in a confined space, and in that space we do not want, uh, we don't want to contaminate the air more than we need to. On top of that, if you're trying to work around uh, smoke detectors and things, they really don't like those little carbon blackbirds floating around. That was too much oxygen. So if you're ever adjusting it, you get something like that, back down on your oxygen, you'll pull in a tight flame. Now, we're gonna back these down. So right about there is your neutral. We pull in a little bit tighter. You get your uh, ionizing. Now we want nice little feathers. You get your reducing. Now there's a whole lot more heat coming out of that. This is just a four. Most of them we use are typically either um, like an eight or 10 port on there. So there's your good reducing flame. Back down just a little. So that's about the most you're gonna get out of this one. The reason it did that is I'm, I'm pushing that tip pretty hard and I, I pushed it past where I should have, right? So what I did there is I backed off on the flame I backed off on the oxygen first, then came back on the acetylene. If you go the wrong direction with it, uh, you'll end up just putting it out, right? So, uh, to increase the flame, increase your acetylene first, and then bring your oxygen in, and then reverse flow. You're going to reduce your oxygen, then reduce your acetylene. Okay? Very critical to keep up with your tips, maintenance of your torches, uh, your gauges, making sure that they're in good condition, functioning. Uh, it's good to have a tip cleaner in your torch kit. Some of the acetylenes will have a turn knob. Some of them will just have a four peg square sticking out of it. Those you can use your service wrench on, okay? I didn't know that for a long time. And sometimes whenever you get those kits, you'll have it, they'll give you a tiny little you know, four pegs uh, wrench, it splits your hand in half and you try to use it, don't. Get your service wrench out, it'll fit over that, that square tip and you can use that to open and close that bottle. Okay, so if it doesn't have a turn knob handle, just get out your service wrench, you're good to go. We did a lot of prep work ahead of time, but your prep work is, part, is half of your brazing job. How well you sand it, how well you clean it, uh, all of that plays into how well that metal is going to stick. It has to be clean. Uh, you, the, if you're using a 15, it's not so critical on copper to copper to use a flux. But if you're using any kind of those uh, uh, softer solders or anything of that nature, you really want a flux on it. So this is part of the color that we're, we're looking for. You'll see how it kind of slowly decre increases. And what that will do is that copper will start to turn kind of a, a, a dull red. Usually by the time you're hitting a, that kind of dull red color, before you go bright red, right? So cherry red's the wrong direction. But if you're getting that dull redness, you're, you're starting to approach that thousand degree mark. So if you look over here at this one, you can see the color temperature is changing as he's going. 
So that color is part of what you're looking for. Now he's not quite there yet. He's still building up to that heat, but he's getting really close because you'll notice the longer he goes, the little bit duller it gets. And that's, that's really uh, the temperature he's honing in on. Now, a thing I'll warn you about is uh, if you're using the, um, the brazing rod as your temperature test, you doing uh, putting the rod in the flame doesn't prove temperature so if you're going to use it for test pull your flame away and run your rod across it and see if it if it changes right it tries to melt softens anything of that nature no so that, that's a more of a uh, oxidizing flame or an ionizing mm -hmm. so uh, you want to increase on your acetylene a little bit So keep stepping up, keep stepping up, keep going. All right, you see that, see that feather come out? Mm -hmm. That feather was what you're looking for. You get a little bit more feather on it. All right, right about there. That's gonna be a good reducing flame. Yeah, w when you're doing the swedge, so right there, that is your the top of your, your quarter inch swedge point. So you have to swedge it up to that point. So right here at the bottom right here, that is your goal. So this should be quarter, this should be for three eighths. Okay. 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 So you gotta get a little taller. Okay. You got a nice flame. Yeah. I'm trying so, to see the color change that you've been talking about. Alright, so so slow it down. I'm gonna take your hand. Just nice and easy. You don't need to move fast, do anything of that nature. No. You're you're st you're coming up into the upper hundreds with that color there, and you're gonna start to see it kind of turn a little more of a dull red. Now, do a color test. You can move over here, get the female just a little bit, and then move back over, and just nice and easy. That's all you're looking for. And part of that distance, what you're part of what you're you're paying attention to is you see how that flame kind of wraps. Yeah. That's all you really need. Once you get to the point where you pass up the pipe, you're you're losing efficiency and time. Oh, okay. Okay. So if you keep that flame where it never loses contact with that pipe, you'll speed up your ability to to control that heat and braise it. Now you're getting really you're getting you're starting to get close. Okay. Not hot, close. Um, Let's keep this going. Now here's something that we can do. Let's just hone in on a spot. Let me show you what the bad looks like. You're just gonna sit here and you're gonna sit here. And you're just gonna keep going. Just keep going. Once by see how that see how that starts to turn kind of you see that brighter red? Yeah. See how that's now the skin of the the surface of the pipe starting to look a little different. Uh, that's that's where you're starting to overheat. So one of the factors that you're fighting, keep in mind, you've got this rag right here. So this is simulating there's a component you can't overheat. So as soon as you, you have to maintain the temperature and this this is adding a level of difficulty right mm -hmm. as soon as you get to that temperature it's not going to stay there okay it's going to immediately start sucking right out of it and it's going to the female side and it's going to the rag mm -hmm. so you've got to recognize mm -hmm. that color and capital exactly okay. now you're getting it so that's melting because your flames on it mm -hmm. right now i'll tell you the same thing i was telling him yeah. this rag is just sucking the heat right out of it mm -hmm. so it's not going to hold that temperature you're going to have to get it to that temp and then you're going to have to maintain that temp without overshooting okay yep. so that's this is where it gets real tricky and it just it takes practice that's the only way to get past this you can see there's a little bit of some black soot so that's one of the ways that as you use the tool to scrub it out mm -hmm. tap it out and then blow it out with your oxygen to clear the ports out. Come this way. There you go. Get both pipes off. There you go. Wait till that liquefies and then hit it. There, now hit it. You want both sides liquid. Both sides of this side of the pipe. Now, something I'm going to warn you. Mm -hmm. Getting hot. You're, you're doing right, but you're starting to lose heat over here on your male. Which, as you lose heat because you're putting all your focus on the female, mm -hmm. you have to balance it. Okay. Okay, you can't just do too much on one side once you're ready to start filling. Okay. 
But you're, you're at a really nice temperature. So kind of like keep it in between? Yeah, but you don't have to be real sporadic. Be real slow. And just work that heat. And watch that feather. You see how that feather is wrapping around the pipe? Yeah, yeah. Oh. That's what you're focusing on. And just keep that heat nice and even. Now, now it, it cooled down a little bit, so bring it back up to temp, and then, uh, and then try to fill it again. Part of your struggle is it's not enough heat. Right. So, what you'll do on your on your acetylene, which is your red, crank that acetylene up. Keep going, keep going. Just nice and easy. Just come up with it. Keep going with it. Keep going. Keep going. All right, so right about there. Now slowly bring your oxygen up. And you want to pull that feather in. Now pull your, you're pulling your oxygen back. You need to increase oxygen, not, not decrease. There you go. Now keep pulling it in. And usually what I'll do is I'll overshoot and I'll go to an ionizing flame and then I'll back back out of it back into a reducing. That's pretty decent right there. I'm good with that. Okay. Now that's going to give you a lot more heat, and it'll it'll just it'll help. It'll help. Okay. There you go. And that's one of the big things. So with smaller pipe, it's mm -hmm. a lot easier to get the heat. When you do this bigger pipe, uh, you do have to kind of do more focused areas. You're not going to get that whole pipe at perfect temperature right out the gate. You're going to have to slowly just work your way around that pipe as you go. So you're doing a good job. Just just keep it up. Now, one of the things that I'm seeing mm -hmm. is, uh, and it's partially just because of the rag, but you're 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 needing to get uh, a little more heat because you, you do, it doesn't look like you got real good capillary action. And part of how I know that is the coloration there. You've got some capillary action, but you didn't get a whole lot. So if we were to cut that apart. You might get just you know an eighth inch, quarter inch in there. It looks like you got maybe a maybe a quarter of an inch, but you didn't really fully uh, seat that joint. Okay. So that just uh, as you work that heat in there, you have to just use the heat to draw that that capillary action in with the torch. All right, that looks really nice. Honestly, you've even got a pretty nice cap on it. Now, here's something about brazing. Mm -hmm. Once you get there, stop. Get away from it. Right. You don't need to keep uh, heating and overheating that same point in the joint. So unless you're trying to go back and, and seal a leak, get move on, get away from that joint. Because what you'll do is just constantly putting heat on it. It starts to weaken that uh, silt, that filler material's ability to properly fill and hold. So you're there. You've got you've got a real nice spot now. And part of what I'm talking about here. Let me see this. See that little bitty yeah. hole. That wasn't there a few seconds ago. Yeah, I was trying to fill that up right now. Yeah, so part of that is because you're just constantly sitting on it with heat. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. You got to move in, move the heat through, fill it, and move on. Don't just sit on it. Taking on the hard one. How's it going so far? Great. Temperature looks like it's doing pretty good. Yeah. Now you're about at the point. Okay. Actually, your steel looks pretty good too. You can see the copper. The copper's got that real nice dull color. It's doing really well on heat. And he's using a small tip on this. Now look at that steel. You see how that steel has a slight color change? And you see even how right there at where the flame is, it's slightly going red. So he's going just a little heavy on the heat right there at the rim. But overall, down in the, and down in the, the metal, you're doing pretty good. And you can compare that to this lower side down here, right? So you can see the color difference between them. Uh, now what I would suggest is as you're moving through that you want to make sure you're moving that that flame down in there But it's different than the copper because the copper you have to focus a lot more of that heat that steel is naturally Just taking it from that copper and it's not rejecting it the same way the copper is So you're not going to have to move that torch quite as much like you would do on copper To get that capillary action to happen the way you want it to those of this seeing it we have a, uh, uh, a line of copper here with different joints that they're brazing on. Over here we have our uh, dielectric that they're brazing. Too much oxygen. Too much? Yeah, back off on your oxygen. Now stop there, back off on your acetylene.
Okay, now slowly come in with your oxygen. Now tune it in from there. And then over here we have our aluminum station. They've got one prepped. Uh, we've, we're, we're pushing how many kits we have on site. And then over here is our annealing station. Now, that some of these are just kind of extra stations. These are our biggest focuses that we really need to hone in on. So based off of that color, you're, you're getting close, but you're not quite there. It's not moving over. Yeah, and keep in mind, as long as that flame is, is on that solder, it's, yeah. it's always going to melt. Keep giving it the acetylene. No, that's oxygen. No, I'm sorry. You went the wrong way. Open the acetylene. Open it. Open it. All right, right about there. Now give it it's a little bit more oxygen. Right there. Yep. You can give it, yeah, that's about right. So that's, that's about the most you're going to get out of that tip. And that little bit higher heat is going to help you have a little bit better control. And it's absolutely hideous. <laughs> you happy with it? Mm -hmm. Nice. Good job. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't expect there to be any leaks on that. That's pretty tight. Now, a word of caution, I want to give on these doing these joints is don't put too much focus on the actual. Uh, uh, point where the cap would go right because if you can put a cap on it but never get capillary action so just keep that in mind is you have to get the capillary action and then you go through and put the cap on as it stands you've got enough heat on your steel you, you want to continue honing in on your copper and then if you're going to put your heat over there bring this over here a little bit and, and get off the steel. You see how it's turning red? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you, you got to get off that steel and then work your way around that copper. So right now, as it stands, oh, see, uh, your copper is turning red. So you're, you're, you're there at temperature. So you just got, you have to get it more even and work it around okay. and start dialing in. Okay. It's just going to take a little practice with a hand. Gotcha. It's, it is a technique. That's warmer than I was. I was too cool. So with that, what flame do you have? That's a ionizing or oxidizing flame. Yes. So, open your acetylene. I'll give it a little more. Just a little bit, alright? Now draw in your, uh, open your oxygen a little bit. Alright. Back off on the oxygen, just, just a hair. Right about there. Now use that. And part of it is, you, you see how that feather is wrapping around the pipe? Just control that. Always make physical contact. Don't break that contact while you're coming up to temperature. Right. Copper so and steel, those things are, are really forgiving. Aluminum is not. The moment you hit that over temp point, it's just, that's it. I mean, it, it's going to disintegrate and it's going to fracture. So, yeah, your heat control, and you don't have the same temperature coloration like what happens with copper. You'll see it start melting before you see yeah. any kind of color change. So you have to really rely on your heat. Your, 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 your heat. You're just, again, experience plays a lot into it. And then using your, your filler to uh, be your temperature gauge. I want everybody to see just how gentle that heat is. He's got a real minimal flame. And he's just barely touching that on there. And you notice there is some color differential. Like you can see just a slight color change, but it is so, so slight. It, it takes a lot of training of your eye to even be able to recognize it. I'm not even sure this camera can capture it. So uh, this, this aluminum is, is very, very delicate, but if you get good at it, it's a great skill to have. All right, very good job. Yep, you got it molten. Just uh, keep, yeah, keep pushing it through. There you go. You almost got the hole made. Nice. Very good job. That's about right, too.
So you got a three eighths tip over here. Tell me it fits. Almost. You need just a little bit bigger. So part of what you can do too is as you heat it back up, yeah, try to push it through. Now, this is where it, it would be very critical to flow nitrogen because you're going to be pushing that flame straight into that pipe. But obviously we're not doing that in this scenario, but in real in a real scenario, that's what you would need to do. We got some good burns, so we did a burn over here. He's about to braise that in. And then over here, they got another burn, put another tap. Very good job.